Hello and welcome to Fibertrek. My name is Sarah. Welcome. You are most welcome to my studio space here in the north woods of Maine. On this edition, I have a few field trips for us. We are headed to Springville, Maine to visit with Susan Mills to talk about the work of Jagger's Fun. I'm going to update you on all of my knitting. We'll also take a jaunt up north to the cabin. If you are a patron of this podcast or have donated through Ko-Fi, a deep heartfelt thank you for your financial contribution. I always appreciate the insight and comments that you provide as we endeavor on this creative journey together. I'm so glad that you're here. Let's catch up. Life is a winding road No telling where it goes Driving through days and nights Won't stop for traffic lights And I I really wanna know, really wanna know If I Will ever figure out where the road goes Even if I'm falling down I will keep on searching for my highs You can say I lost my mind I will keep on holding my head high Even if the sky is falling down the first projects that I completed was done in Jagger Spun Zephyr Wool Silk, which was over 20 years ago. It seemed only right to visit this particular mill and talk a little bit about their history and the work that they're doing. They have an extensive line of hand knitting and weaving yarns, but they also extend into other industries. And I wanted to get a scope and a feel for what a top spinning mill 
would look like and how it might operate. And obviously, a little yarn candy. Thank you so much to Jagger's Fun for hosting me. I am looking forward to coming back very soon. Well, sometimes I start out a little silly. I always find getting started to be really challenging. Mm. So I'm just going to jump in. Okay. I'm here with Susan Mills, and we are at Jagger's Fun like Mick Jagger. Like Mick Jagger. And I wanted to just take an opportunity to highlight some of the mill industry that happens in Maine because we do have such a rich history and you were so gracious. I kind of went after you at the fiber frolic <laughs> at your booth and you were so gracious to um, host me today and take me around. And I just thought we would talk a little bit about kind of the history and then process and then look at beautiful yarn. Okay. So I hope Sounds that's easy good. for you. Um, so let's just start right off with w why we're here, um, why the mill is here, and how it got started. Okay, well that's a long story. There's a lot of history <laughs> for Jagger Brothers. So David Jagger, who currently owns the mill and Jagger Spun, they're two different businesses. His great-grandfather came in the 1800s to be a superintendent at the Goodall Mills in Sanford. Sanford was an old mill town. And that would have been a paper mill? No, nope. nope. woolen mill. Woolen mill, okay. And so he came from Bradford, England with his family and to work as a superintendent at the Goodall Mills. Um, his two sons started Jagger Brothers in the late 1800s. Um, they moved a couple of times and it was one of their sons who moved the business here in 19, in the 1950s. Okay. Um, so David is the fourth generation of Jaggers to spin yarn in Southern Maine here. That's amazing. And they moved to this facility in the 50s, you said? Yes, this yeah. building. This building used to be an alpaca weaving mill before that and they bought it in the 50s for Jagger Brothers. Jagger Brothers used to be in on down in South Stanford in okay. on Jagger Mill Road um, in a old old building that used water power from the Mousam right. River to um, so when the river was low they couldn't spin much. Right. <laughs> I I I mean I've known about the history of uh, historic value of rivers and mills and that kind of you know synergy but I'm con I have never heard of the, an alpaca weaving mill I mean, that's in the what 50s. this building was built for. So it's a really solid building yeah. because weaving mills, because of the vibration of the looms, have to be sturdier than spinning mills. Oh, that's fascinating. Excellent. So, really um, long presence here in the Southern Maine area and then in this building since the 50s. Right. That's amazing. And really, they started out, I'm assuming, spinning Maine wool or New England wool. I'm not sure yeah. back in the day what they spun, but we're a worsted spinning mill, not a woolen spinning mill, so we need combed top to spin. Okay. And there are no combing facilities. No. There are only two in the U.S., in Texas and in North or South Carolina. Um, so we have to have comb top because we're a worsted spinner. Right. Um, so we've always been a worsted spinner, so I'm not sure whether they, the Goodall Mills had combs at one time. Right. I'm not sure oh. where that came from. Okay. A lot of our wool now comes from either Argentina or the UK because we can have it combed there. Right. So it's coming as combed top from right. both of those origin points. Right. Okay. And then we spin it here at Maine. Okay, cool. And when we talk about spinning, let's, we can, we, it's not just getting, um, wool top and spinning it. There's also the idea of creating different plies. Um, and so if we want to think about your line of wool as worsted wool, it's not just mono, mono, I'm thinking of <laughs> monotone, like it's all two ply worsted. Can you talk no. a little bit about the no, different? No, so there's worsted weight, which is a totally different yeah, yeah. thing than worsted spun. So we can spin any weight. The mill spins lots of really thin, um, yarns for weaving, for spinning, for plying, for other customers. We're only one of their customer. Okay. Um, so I told you about the long history of the Jaggers. So in the 1980s, Dave, David Jagger, the current owner, started Jagger Spun so that we can sell, we can have dyed yarns and we can sell, sell stock service to small manufacturers, to yarn stores, 
to smaller people who d don't want to have us spin 10,000 pounds. Right. You know, who right. want a couple of cones of yarn or 10 pounds of yarn. So that was started in the 1980s. Okay. So spinning for other commercial facilities, um, spinning for the hand knitter, spinning for the both the commercial weaver and a hand and cottage industry weaver, right. right? So there's kind of a couple different prongs with for the product when it leaves the mill. Right. Okay. So the mill is known now as uh, Worsted Spinning New England. David no longer, he owns the building, he doesn't own the spinning okay. business anymore, but he does still own Jagger Spun. Okay. Okay. It's complicated. Got it. Yep, I can see all the different <laughs> um, avenues. Um, owns a building, but somebody else owns the equipment right. and the business end of it. Right. Yep. Um, so your hand knitting line, um, is it all two ply or do you have... Oh no, no, we have all different weights, all different, you know, yeah. individual plies of different weights. We have everything from lace weight to bulk. Right. My first, um, one of my first knitting projects that I uh, did when I moved to Maine, I had been knitting here and there, uh, but one of the first exemplary ones I did was the Zephyr Silk 50-50 yep. um, and I knit the Bird's Nest Shawl from Folk Shawls and it was in this like really deep magenta color and I knit it holding two strands together. Which is still thin. Yeah, which is still thin and I, I will showcase that. I meant to bring it but I hadn't gone home to bring it back. Um, but it is one of the most beautiful pieces. I've had it forever. And I think we have the market on the 50-50 wool silk. Yeah, you I do. don't know anybody else that sells that in cones or skeins. No. And the nice thing is I did buy mine on cones. So that right. was a real boon to the project because it was such a huge project and I wasn't like constantly adding in new. So we have that 50-50 wool silk in the lace weight and then this is the uh, worsted weight. Worsted weight. Yeah, so we'll, I'll kind of go through and um, just grab some um, footage so all of you can appreciate all of the diverse amount of weights, plies, um, and all the different things you can do with this particular brand that's coming out for hand knitters. So do you, ha you don't have anybody that's in this state that's using your wool in woven products, like it's going to oh, we sell upholstery. To lots Both. of weavers. Yeah. Um, small hand weavers and you know smaller manufacturers um, yeah right we sell mostly most of our yarn is sold on cones to weavers but we're getting more and more yarn stores as customers right. who want skein yarn. yeah and it's been nice to see you um, hit that market in a couple different I have a couple friends like the woolly thistle carries your right. yarn and I've seen it up at one loop and so right yeah that's been great well I I know we kind of talked a little bit about the history um, and kind of the market, but I really would love to see that process. So can we talk about from beginning when you get top dropped off to the end, it comes in on a big, what does that look like when, it, when you have top come in? So they're, depending on the bale, they're anywhere from 800 to 1200 pounds of wool. Uh, wrap tightly in a big right. cube. Um, you'll see it out in the mill. Um, so from there, there's a lot of steps before we actually get to spinning the yarn, okay. plying the yarn. Um, in a woolen mill, there are many fewer steps. Okay. They basically can have dyed wool, cart it, spin it, and we have to go through um, we go through two steps in drafting, three steps in pin drafting before we make it into like a pencil roving. Okay, yeah. Then it can go to the spinning frame. Okay. So there's many more steps in a worsted spun yarn than a woolen spun. Yeah, I'll be curious to see what the bale of top looks like because my image is like that it kind of already is drafted, but it's not. It's coming as a big It's bolt. combed, but it's still in big bumps. Big, yeah, bumps. And so then you have to take it. Um, down to the, diff the varying lengths. Right, and draft weights. it to get it the right um, thickness for whatever weight right. we're going to spin. Right, because you can always, from as a hand spinner, I know that when I take a piece of top out and I draft it or I comb it, um, and I and I take it off my combs, I can get smaller, but I can never obviously go bigger than right. what I've drafted off. So all of that kind of has to be pre-planned right. right prior to going into the to the spinning right. portion of what it's gonna be. Um, I know that you and I briefly chatted um, before we started about color um, and how that can be a challenge um, if you're not just putting out natural um, colors that are coming in. So you do have it dyed. 
We do. Um, we have yarns that are dyed, that are spun natural and dyed. And then we have um, heather yarns, which we buy the dyed top from okay. the UK and then we blend to our recipes to get our okay. color range. Yeah, I was going to ask you about the heather pieces and how you were able to do that because I do think dyed in the wool and then spun is such a magical oh, process. It's, it's, I changes just it all. I love to see them and blending when they're, you know, making yeah. a new lot. Just to, it's like magic to yeah. see like this the primary colors go in and the blended top come right. out. Awesome. So comes in as top and then we're going to see a little bit of how that unfolds in the mill. Yep. Awesome. When I was visiting the mill, not every piece of equipment was running, for example, these pin drafters, but I did get a chance to feel and experience the magnitude of this equipment. For example, this is the spinning portion of or one of the floors. So there was this real juxtaposition of old and new technology. Here is a little quality control, which I found fascinating. I've slowed this down for you. Those bobbins are being uh, connected. You can see the machine connecting two ends together by blowing them. They are looking for inconsistencies in the yarn and where there is one, they cut it out and reconnect. And this creates a cone, which then is going to go on to plying. Initially, the cones are or the plies are put together onto a cone, but not twisted. And this is done on a separate machine. Again, an opportunity to just look and feel and experience what these old mills were like. They are very loud, and so it was hard to interview Susan while we were up on the floors. Here is some yarn being skeined off. Again, that juxtaposition of old and new. It was really thrilling to be in the mill and kind of experiencing all of the sensory parts of this process, not to mention the beautiful yarns. Thank you again, Jaggerspun, for hosting me. I can't wait to come back. Welcome to the knitting portion of the episode. I just want to take a moment and thank everyone who takes the opportunity to contribute financially to this creative project, whether that's through Patreon, which is more of a subscription uh, type platform, it's just about $3 per episode per month, or through a one-time donation through Ko-Fi. Thank you so much for making room to donate to uh, what's happening here. I so welcome the insights and comments, the feedback, the reciprocity of connection and community. Again, thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. So on this edition, let's just cut right to it and take and talk about something that I've finished. It's been a long time coming. This is the Frockengard uh, sweater. Oh, by the way, <clears throat> you may hear a bit of the uh, sound quality of my voice is a little bit compromised. Um, that might be in part uh, due to the fact that 
it's just coming on to the Thanksgiving holiday here in the States and usually that's about the time where my immune system takes a deep breath after working really in overdrive uh, as it combats all of the little children and their very own uh, germ journey. Um, and sometimes that just catches up uh, and it attempts to take over. But elderberry and zinc to the rescue, I've been, uh, I take that regularly, but I've been anti-upping my zinc and uh, chicken and garlic. So uh, I think I'm on the other side, but uh, it's, it has affected the uh, quality of my voice. Anyway, the Froken Guard is finished. Um, it is a pattern from Koftaboken 2 and 3. There's a children's version and an adult version. I've been working on this since th 2020. My friend and I cast this on as a go back to school COVID project in solidarity. And uh, I'm using Hillisvog Solia in the cognac colorway and Vilja in the white, which is the lamb's wool. And let's see, this sweater is been translated from by my friend and then kind of retro worked for top down. I've added short rows uh, to the neck and I have made it a pullover versus a cardigan. So it was supposed to have more positive ease, but three years is a long time. And so we've moved into the negative, negative ease fit. Uh, the arms are very comfortable. I did shorten the arm length a bit because I didn't want a bunch of bulk um, on my wrists. And I also wanted bracelet length sleeves because I do wear a lot of bracelets. And I did a garter stitch cuffs and hem. And what else can I tell you? I did a roll neck, which is just a basic, I uh, just cast on and knit for a couple rows and then started the color work. So it is finished. It, it felt insurmountable at the time that I was working on it and I feel like it has become a huge achievement and it is very motivating and I can't wait to cast on the yell on size three needles and all the color work so let's have it. Uh, speaking of which I did put the order in for that yarn. I ordered it from Wool and Company. Um, it was hard to find the amounts that I needed so I needed like seven skeins of the Moret, which is a dark brown colorway. And I know the Woolly Thistle carries uh, Spindrift and Schoolhouse Press, um, but I wanted to be able to get everything in one order and Wool and Company had Moret, Esket, which were my two main colors. And then I ordered a variety of different uh, contrast colors to fool around with. I also wanted to be able to order at that time some more yarn for my sweater that I'm knitting for my nephew Cameron and I am using Alavaz Lopi. So originally I had been using a contrast color in glacial blue, I think it's called, but I wanted to change that up. So when I was looking to order my Spindrift, it was really nice. I could just order the Lopi with it uh, and so that kind of all made that package work out for me. So. Frokengard is finished. Hooray. What did I cast on? If you've been following me, you'll know that I cast on an Icelandic yoke for my nephew, um, which I was just referencing, called Finar. It's from the Best of Lopi. I'm knitting the numbers for the size 12. I'm using a US 10 and a half needle. I knit the cuffs and hems on a nine. And I did that in a two by two rib versus a one by one. But here it is, I've attached the arms to the yoke. I did add short row shaping um, in the back and I did um, probably, let's see, I did one, two, th I did three rows of short row sh shaping. So overall, I think six rows, um, which would probably be just about an inch. <clears throat> and I ordered this contrast color in light indigo. I had teal, I had the glacial blue. Um, I think I also ordered a lighter denim blue, but ultimately I landed on this because I felt like stylistically it fit the overall feel of the sweater better than the glacial blue. The glacial, which I don't have with me, but it's at the bottom of this sweater. It just felt a little bit too, I don't know, cold glacial right? Um, 
while Cameron did say he didn't mind it, he liked it, um, I think that this uh, indigo color suits it a little better. It just tones it down. It works with the brown, um, and it's a little bit more his style. So I hope to have this done um, maybe even this weekend. Um, I'd love to get, give it to him by Thanksgiving so he can wear it for a good portion of the cold winter here. Uh, I plan on retrofitting the neckline because it is knit right up to the um, base of the neck and it is a, a ribbed collar. But I think I'm gonna end up doing a similar rolled collar, a little bit wider than this. Um, I knit the Dog Star by Tin Can Knits and I used, uh, I used that as well. I just cast on, I think, um, to, I know what I'm trying to say, but it doesn't, it may not look like it, but uh, instead of casting on and then increasing after two rows, I just cast on like the second increase row um, to have a bit wider. <clears throat> As much as Cameron um, has assured me that, you know, the wool doesn't itch him, it doesn't bother him, he's he's wool worthy, uh, I do know what it feels like to have a uh, low P right next to your neck. Um, and so I want to kind of, again, ease him into that experience. Um, and I, I actually might myself prefer a little bit more open neckline. So I will be, uh, fooling around with that. I won't be adding any short rows to the collar um, because the um, collar work goes right to the end. So that's why I, I opted to add color work, uh, add, opted, golly, opted to add a short row shaping when I put the sleeves um, together for the yoke. So um, unless I, if I didn't say it, because this is the second time I've recorded this, um, this is knit bottom up, sleeves are added at the yoke uh, versus top down. So. I'm really happy with the way that um, the brown yarn, which is uh, my own sheep's fleece that was spun at a rustic fiber mill, I'm really happy with the way that's performing and working with the Alifas Lopi. And um, yeah, overall, I'm, I'm really in love with this project and I have been really enjoying, and I know that I've talked about this a couple episodes, um, especially with crochet, feeling that completion, seeing things grow, getting them off the needles, moving them out. Um, that's been really satisfying. Um, and I think, you know, having worked on this particular project for so long, um, it was nice to have a few wins. I did finish a sweater for my my small niece, uh, Annie, my youngest niece, and, um, and this sweater uh, will be off pretty soon. And out in the world being used and uh, keeping someone I love warm uh, and that's so gratifying. Now that being said, this broken guard I took with me to uh, the cabin this past weekend, you probably saw some footage of that, and my niece was wearing it and she uh, wanted to wear it continually. It was a little bit big for her so I said maybe you need your own and she said it looks like I've outgrown my itch Auntie Sarah. So she wants, she really wanted to have it in this um, same yarn on the Solia. So I am looking at a couple things. First of all she needed to pick out a pattern so we immediately did that of course because that's super fun. And she knew without looking at anything that she wanted something with dogs on it. This doesn't surprise me. She is uh, very tuned in to animals, especially dogs. And <clears throat> I found one by Linka Newman called the, I have, I have it here, hold on. Called the Vilmax Barn um, that has dog paws on it. So she decided to do that. This is knit in a DK on a US 4. <clears throat> and I kind of wanted to fool around with the sizing. So I am looking at using Tinda, which is the heavier weight of Solya uh, from the Norsk uh, pelt sheet. And I'm also looking at potentially using Knitting for Olive in the Heavy Merino. So I know my niece well enough. Uh, she doesn't like things close to her neck. She doesn't like things tight on her chunky things uh, on her legs. She doesn't like her snow pants. She doesn't like sweatpants. So I kind of want to ease into the I've outgrown my itch uh, declaration a little bit. And I thought the knitting for all of heavy merino would be uh, a great way to do that. So when we were looking at projects, I thought for sure she would pick pink and teal and uh, but she landed on some be a beautiful combination of browns, like a really beautiful cream, a deep 
dark uh, brown and then like a light hazelly hazelnut uh, kind of overall color. So the two contrasts are the dark brown and the white and then just kind of like really mocha color. And I was like, are you sure? Because I really love that color combination. Um, and she said, yes, it's my favorite. So hooray. So I need to make that order and um, and again, uh, get that needle on, I uh, get that sweater on the go. I'm really excited about it. Um, and I think if I have access to the chart and the number of patterns and the repeat, I'll hopefully be able to tweak um, the sizing a bit so I can go up on the needle gauge and use a couple different types of yarns. Uh, there is also a uh, adult version of this particular sweater that's knit in let lopi so um, which I might buy for myself so I can have matching sweaters nerd out auntie -ness. Um so that's kind of rolling around in my head and um, it's always nice as I said before to uh, knit for my nieces and nephew because they just cherish all of those uh, particular pieces. So we'll see um, if I can get organized for that and have it done for Christmas. The other thing I've been working on since this was done um, is I hauled out my Trondheim cowl by Sophia Carlson from uh, the designer Sophia's Tales. This is knit in Kashgora from Cashmere People Yarns, which is available through Port Fiber. Casey is the distributor, distributor of that yarn. It's hand spun and dyed in Tajikistan. And then um, I got mine from Casey a while ago at a show. So the one thing that uh, I, I love this pattern is super methodical and really easy to lean into. But I do get a bit, and I again, this comes up, um, I want to knit this cowl, uh, which is knit in the round. I want to knit it so I can have a double wrap, and it's a lot of knitting. <laughs> I should just suck it up and do it. Um, so I am knitting this on a US, I think this is a two, might be a three. So sometimes I, I'm knitting and I'm like, I haven't gotten anywhere, and then I just chuck it aside. Um, but I have a little bit more uh, stamina uh, for that with some of these wins that I've had on the larger needles, so I'm hoping that um, I can get um, a fair amount done here over the holiday and um, just focus on it for a little while, while some of these other projects percolate and evolve, like the yell. So I've been working on that, and I did cast off my um, mashup of the, I think I may have said this last time, uh, the Salalu sweater from the Nida Kalavala. Uh, this is by uh, Yana Costet, and I am using the Hilo sweater, which is through Tidal Yarns, and I'm using this, uh, I'm using Tidal Yarns for, fly, for it. So I've cast off, and I just did it in a twisted rim, one by one twisted rim. And so I need to just pick up and do the sleeves, which will be really another nice thing to lean into uh, because it's just stuck in it. And I will probably do bracelet length sleeves on that. So there've been a few transitional um, points with some finishes, sleeve adding, color work yoke, binding off. So I've had a, a number of different um, experiences with my knitting that's kind of kept me going. Um, at this point and some planning. Speaking of planning, um, I, because it was so convenient, uh, I ordered a sweater's worth of Let Lopi and to knit myself a new Drema by Jennifer Steingass. My original Drema was knit in Starcroft uh, in the Muckle Marl and her Nash Island Light and the Raven color. Um, <clears throat> but I was really attracted to these two colors and this is, let me double check what this one is. Mm, rats, the name isn't on here. I think is it North Atlantic or Northern Seas? Um, so this is gonna be the main color. And then the contrast color work will be done in one color of the light beige. And um, that particular sweater has two versions where you can do kind of a, a chromatic shift in the color work between light grays and all the way down to white and a dark background, but I'm opting just to do regular so I did order that and man is it I I just love buying lopi yarn and being able to get a sweater sweaters worth at that price point um, <clears throat> the other thing that I uh, um, acquired purchased was on my visit to uh, Jaggerspun <laughs> um, I have been attracted to Jaggerspun 
I say that, I'll, I don't know why I say Jagger, Jagger spun um, Heathers for a long time. And um, so I wanted to mess around with them for color work. Madison had actually thought about using this for her particular sweater, but um, as I said, ultimately I had decided that I wanted to work with um, uh, something maybe a little bit more in her uh, sensory wheelhouse, if you will. Um, I came out of the mill store um, with a couple skeins of their BFL. So this is um, oatmeal and it's 100 grams. It's 370, 370 yards. So we're looking at a little bit like a sport weight. Um, but it's a really beautiful color. It has a really beautiful hand. Again, um, Jagger Spun is a top spinning mill. So top spinning mill. So everything is prepared as top, it's combed, um, and comes in as combed to top and it is spun there and plied. So I picked up the um, BFL and I also <clears throat> went ahead and picked up a few of the heathers um, in different colors. I had um, some ideas about using, doing a color work yoke. You could then use the leftovers in a crochet blanket. So I wanted to have a variety of different um, representations and I was able to get <clears throat> some 50 gram skeins versus 100 gram skeins. So I just picked up some colorful ones here, some pops in the heathers. It's 100% wool combed top. And um, that was just to have just some choices about um, uh, color. And, um, and then I picked up some 50 grand skeins in some of the darker colors um, in these kind of neutrals. So I had a lot of fun visiting the mill and as you saw in the, the little field trip video, um, it was really inspiring to be in a shop with such beautiful yarns and also to not only just to be in the shop but have everything being made um, while I was there and they were very generous with their time to take me around and so a special thank you to Sue for that. Um, I don't know where I'm going to end up next. I, I've been planning a lot of projects for the children. Um, and that's been really, again, as I said, satisfying because they're smaller, it works up faster. I've been using gauges that are bulkier. Um, we have the yell coming in, um, but there's a little, I think, wiggle room here. I'm gonna work on the sleeves for the Salalu. But um, I had started a Teti Lutzak, uh, is it Roots and Shoots? A sweater a while ago in New Tiden and knitting for olive mohair and I would like to bring that back out and work on that. I am still working on the Faroese shawl in the single strand New Tiden but I haven't touched it since I cast on for Cameron's sweater and so I feel like once the children are kind of settled into their knitwear for the winter I could just refocus on some of the sweater product projects and other projects I have going for myself. Um, that goes with quilts too. Um, I need to get Cameron's quilt done, Madison's quilt done, and I'll kind of be done with quilts for kids for a while. So that is what's been percolating around in my mind. And I'm also looking forward to bringing to you the turning of the year this, uh, this month. Um, that's four episodes, one episode a week. Um, and things could be a little dicey that first week. My mom is having surgery and I'm going to be down south, but I am not to be deterred. Um, maybe get some things uh, planned and finished um, here. As far as decorating goes, I am learning to render my own beef suet. Rob and I are doing that tonight because we're going to make a traditional fruit cake and we're going to do some steamed pudding. And um, so, yeah, that's the big exciting Sunday night for Rob and Sarah is rendering beef suet. Um, <clears throat> so we've got a few things that um, we want to get done uh, before we head south to my parents. And that also includes our Christmas tree for the seasons. So. Right. I am going to bid you a fond farewell. Till I see you next time, many fond wishes and blessings. Take care. Bye.